Hello, my name is Dr. David Bray, an inaugural director at the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center, and this is Fast Thinking. NASA and partners from seven other nations made a major step towards cooperation on and around the moon on May the 5th, 2020, with the signing of the Artemis Accords. Since then, four more nations have signed the agreement, bringing the total number of signees to 12. Brazil just signing on June the 15th, 2021. However, traditional space power Russia and emerging power China have spurned the agreement and chosen to work independently with China, launching three crew members into space on June the 17th of 2021 as part of a plan to build their own space initiative to be completed by the end of 2022. Today on Fast Thinking, we're asking two important questions. First, how can NASA assemble a global alliance for governing space in the modern age? And two, can we truly have global agreement about space without Russia and China at the table? I'd now like to go to Inku Khan, who is a fellow with the Atlantic Council Geotech Center. He's also Lieutenant with the US Air Force. However, he's representing himself in a personal capacity. And Inku, the first question I'd like to ask you is, how can NASA assemble a global alliance for governing space in the modern age? Well, thank you for having me, David. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think the United States sits at a really uh, advantageous position in the world. If you look at all of the major spacefaring companies right now, uh, Blue Origin, SpaceX, and even Virgin Galactic, even though it has a British uh, parent company, they're all headquartered in the United States. So all these uh, commercial companies are bringing some attraction. And if you look at anywhere in the world right now, space is a hot, hot topic. I think what NASA is doing at the moment is actually really smart at recognizing that some of the governance measures and some of the situation we have in space is outdated and pushing forward saying we are going to use what we have at, with the resources that we have and the partners that we have to set new norms, new standards and go forward in this new commercial age of uh, space exploration. If NASA keeps pursuing these policies and reaching out to other nations who might be interested, I think it'd be a really, really smart way to position the United States as a leader in this new era of space exploration. Well, I mean, and, and just, you know, sort of half joking, but also seriously, are we seeing like maybe the, 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 the metaphorical formation of the United Federation of Planets? Is that what this is, Inku? Or is it, is, it, is it also thinking about how you can bring along commercial companies too? Is it not just nations, but commercial companies too? Well, I hope we can live in a world where we can live long and prosper at the same time. But at the same time, I, I come to the realization, or I think the world should come to the realization that a lot of reality is actually not exactly what Star Trek is envisioning. Because if you look at the Artemis Accords, there are two key absentees from those accords. And that being the second and third major spacefaring nations in the world, that being, of course, China and Russia, respectively. And Although it might be nice to envision this as a global partnership, it in reality is almost similar to a spheres of influence approach where the United States is pushing forward with its partners. But at the same time, Russia and China are saying, I do not want to be a part of this. And in fact, they're pursuing a parallel agreement uh, to uh, research the moon. And also China sent three astronauts to their own space station as opposed to the International Space Station, which they are not a member of. And there's some that are actually sort of wondering with China put a putting in their own space station. There's also the question about how long will the International Space Station stay up or, or, or will it actually be something where we need to actually have renewed investment on, too? So so as you look at what's happening with China doing its own space station, um, you know, do we still have interest and momentum on the International Space Station or is everyone now placing their sights on the moon and Mars and beyond? So so could you talk a little bit about, Inko, you know, your thoughts about what's happening with our own just orbit of our own different space stations and then moon and the Mars from there? Well, if you look back at the 1990s when the uh, International Space Station was established, it was almost a very hopeful event in humanity where Russia and the United States, uh, the rival Cold War powers, came together and said, you know what, space will be a domain for humanity. It will not be a domain for uh, geopolitics. It will not be a domain to have our own spheres. It will be a united front. Now, since then, keep in mind that China has been excluded from the International Space Station with the Wolf Amendment. Uh, because the United States was fearing that China would steal intellectual property and valuable national security assets from the International Space Station. So by excluding them, we actually inadvertently created that in and of itself. Now, moving forward, I think uh, the International, International Space Station can and should have renewed life. I think uh, there are global interests in space. We can think about uh, orbital debris. We can think about arms control. We can think about exploration for the sake of all humanity. So 
I don't think the International Space Station should be left defunct, and I think uh, a renewal is in ready uh, uh, for uh, the future. That being said, it will take renewed emphasis because at the moment, the hot button issues are not uh, international cooperation in space, but international competition in space. And, and building on, like you said, I mean, unfortunately, as much as we want cooperation to be the hot areas, it's more a competition. We're also seeing on a commercial side, Inku, I mean, I know at the Atlantic Council, uh, with the report we just came out, the Geotech Center's report, uh, specifically the Commission on the Geopolitical Impacts of New Technologies and Data, you were very instrumental on, on helping with our Chapter 6, which focused on the future of space. And one of the big things we're pointing out is we're going from predominantly most of the assets in space being government operated to by the end of this decade, by 2030, most of the things will be commercially operated, that lower Earth orbit is already experiencing a, a, a metaphorical explosion of commercial assets, both with Starlink, uh, what Blue Origin is doing, uh, what other um, other companies are doing as well to launch satellites and for communications purposes and more. But as we think about that, the way we've written both the Artemis Accords with, the, with dealing with the moon, but also thinking about what we have in existing space treaties and things like that, they were for an era that was about governments being in space and not thinking about how it was going to be a majority of commercial things in space. And so I'd be interested in your thoughts, Inku, both on, on what the commercial side means and, and what are other areas of potential global cooperation moving forward in terms of what might be the hot spots that we'd like to focus on if we want to avoid conflict. And I think that is the most important backdrop that you just brought up, David, because you're right. The treaties were written in an era when it was it would have been unimaginable to have private companies and let alone individuals at this point going into space. So if we look at uh, the legal framework that's been established, it pretty much puts uh, nations uh, at responsibility. Uh, it puts the responsibility of any spacefaring activity on the individual nation. And that might sound pretty good, but at the same time, as you mentioned, if you look at uh, what's been going on in space at the moment, um, most of the activities are shifting to commercial uh, uh, ventures. And if we want to be able to empower the commercial sector, to address some of the most wicked challenges on Earth, ranging from climate change, uh, food insecurity, uh, water insecurity, energy insecurity. We need to set the stage for them to succeed. And by not cooperating with China and Russia, we actually, I believe, endanger some of these ventures. Because if you think about it, orbital debris knows no nationality. It can hinder uh, any sort of venture, regardless if it's from China, regardless if it's from Russia or the United States. Um, arms control, those can all affect any single company. It can affect any nation. And at the moment, more and more nations, more and more companies, and more and more individuals are getting access to space. So it really comes down to, are we going to present the world an opportunity to use emerging commercial space assets to help the world and to ameliorate some of the world's most wicked problems? Or are we going to use it to keep battling with each other when that should not be the priority at the moment? Well, and, and, and then we see, like you said, as we talk about how we need to cooperate, that we cannot address some of these issues, such as climate change, how we address orbital debris without thinking about how we go it together. And in the backdrop, you've got, uh, you know, were you the one that bid $40 million for that seat with Jeff Bezos to go into space, Inku? I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't personally have $40 million, but, but, you know, we've got commercial space tourism on the horizon. And, and, and I want to give a shout out to, to colleagues uh, at our own NIH, as well as NSF uh, with the United States National Science Foundation and National Institutes for Health, where they're actually showing how you can use imagery from space to actually detect things such as cholera. And it's going to be quite possible that if we want to think about future pandemic alerts, you may actually be able to use observations from space to serve as alerts to the entire world as a whole if a possible outbreak is actually going to be another future pandemic. And so it may show that, you know, if we want to actually address some of our solutions here at home, we have to be cooperative. Um, one additional thought for you, Inku, and I'd be interested in your thoughts about who else needs to be included in the coalition for the Artemis Accords? And if China and Russia are going to go it alone, are they going to start uh, pulling, and, and forgive the pun, are they going to start pulling people into their orbits as well? Uh, what do we see next on both the Artemis Accords Alliance as well as what China and Russia might partner with as well? The most uh, fundamental and the most pressing challenges will require some sort of cooperation. Now, I don't think the United States and China and Russia needs to cooperate on every single space issue, and there are uh, legitimate national interest concerns that bar us from doing so. But on key issues such as uh, orbital debris, arms control, and uh, human exploration, those are areas where it might be in our interest to actually cooperate. At the end of the day, um, all these issues are human issues. They are not national issues. And for that to be relieved, 
we actually have to work with China and Russia. And it seems from uh, past experiences that China and Russia may be willing to work with us on specific issues. Of course, there might be some pernicious reasons behind it, but on certain key issues, we might be able to cooperate for the benefit of all nations. And if we don't cooperate, this is the danger. I mean, even today, China and Russia announced that there are nations willing to work with them on the parallel uh, Artemis Accords Agreement. So if uh, we go back to the original treaties, the intent behind that was to ensure that no single nation or coalition of nations would appropriate, appropriate space. So no one could claim the moon, no one could claim an asteroid. But if you think about it, let's say you have a Chinese and Russian uh, company on the moon, and then you have the Artemis Accords Coalition also on the moon. By the treaties themselves, those companies will need to follow the jurisdiction of their launching state. So what does it mean if there's two parallel bases on the surface of the moon that will follow two different national laws? It comes down to, are we going to cooperate or are we going to keep continuing down this path blindly and not recognizing the challenges that are ahead? Well said, and like you said, if we do not figure out how to work together in space, we're going to continue the conflicts we already have here on the planet, and it's going to make it so that space is not something that actually uplifts the entire human species as a whole. So I think you you, you put a really sort of fine laying of the scene that we need to be considered there, there Inku. And I'm, I'm reminded, Inku, that there is that pale blue dot, that imagery that Carl Sagan has shared, that all, the only home we've ever known, we need to work together to treasure it. And so with that, I want to thank you, Inku, for sharing your thoughts. And to our audience on Fast Thinking, please join us for future episodes. And as we like to say, please be bold, please be brave, and please be benevolent for the future ahead. <laughs>